Good morning, church. Welcome to worship and welcome to Wald Lake United Methodist Church. It is a blessing to be here uh, with you on the Lord's Day. I am Reverend Kenny Walkup, and I'll lead you through worship this morning. If you're a first-time uh, visitor today, whether you're here in person or online, a special uh, welcome to you. And if you're visiting us online this morning, I invite you to drop me a note, Rev Kenny at Wald Lake. UMC.org, and let's begin a conversation about how this church may be the perfect place for you and your family to grow closer to Christ. The mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And how we live out that mission here locally becomes our vision. I'd like to say it with me. Showing compassion in our community by sharing the light and love of Christ. Thank you so much. When you came in, you got one of our yellow connection cards. Please fill that card off for us. Let us know you're here. If anything has changed, make a note on the card. And if you're here for the first time visiting with us, please fill out that card completely. We want to welcome you in the coming week. On the back of that card, you can jot down your prayer request for this day. Whether it's a joy you're celebrating or a, or a concern that you have, you can jot them both down there. And then make a note at the bottom. Check one of those two boxes for me that says, for pastor only or for me to share this morning with our, with our congregation. A couple of things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday, August 21st, 11 o'clock following service, is our next membership class. If you have not yet become an official member of this congregation, please come to that class. I might just come to the class. We're going to have lunch here for you. Michelle's not said what it is yet, but sound. <laughs> She's making motions. I can't tell what she means. We're going to have food. We're having lunch here that day. Uh, so please join us that day to learn more about the church, its ministries, missions, and determine if it's the right fit for you here in the church. You can sign up in the parlor, please. And then in two Sundays, August 28th, there's a party being planned in our parlor also. And it's a party, and I'm so grateful for Staff Parish as we uh, have a graduation party for, uh, for me. So come to my party, please. Come to my party. Uh, I actually graduate this Thursday uh, in four days. Not that I'm counting the hours. It's 1130, so yeah. In four days, I graduate from course of study at the Methodist Theological School of Ohio. So a party in two weeks to celebrate that, and we invite you all to come join us that day for snacks and for light refreshments and a uh, and apparently uh, they're going to bedazzle a uh, mortarboard hat for me to wear. So you might want to come and check that out also. That's all of our announcements. I invite you now to bow and to pray with me. Most gracious and loving God, we just give you all the praise and glory on this beautiful Sunday morning. We thank you for our visitors this morning that came to church. The two Sandhill cranes that stood by our front door. Even the birds come the morning here to worship and celebrate your love for us. Loving God, as we enter our morning worship, we ask you to please open our hearts and minds that we may receive the message today fully. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ's loving name that we pray. Amen. Here's my opening question for you this morning. Have you ever visited a vineyard? They all giggle. Now I invite you to sit back and to make yourself available to the Holy Spirit. Let us begin our morning worship service.
Good morning. Please stand if you are able to for the call to worship. We cry out, restore us, O God. We petition, God, may your face shine upon us. We lift our voices. We turn to you, O God, and call on your name. <clears throat> now please turn and greet each other with the love of Christ. Please remain standing and join us in our first hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. may be seated. I'd like to invite the children up for our children's message now. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. You. We're missing one. Did you lose your brother? He's in the back. Okay, that's okay. Well, he, he's going to wish he was here because I brought, I brought treats today. Ooh. Do you like treats? Do you like treats? Yeah, I bought treats. Are you ready? What do you think it is? Candy canes. Candy canes. Not yet. What do you think it is? Uh, no. Gingerbread house. Wow. You're a couple months early. Here you go, ready? Are you ready? Are you excited? It's grapes. <laughs> <laughs> she just completely deflated. <laughs> do, do you like grapes? Do you like grapes? No. No. 
Last week, yes, no. Do you want a grape? You can have one. Here you go. Do you want a grape? You want a grape? Yeah. Grapes. I like grapes. Oh, you want a grape? Okay. Here you go. Mm. That thing does come out of your mouth. <laughs> awesome. I like grapes. Do you like red or green better? Don't. What do you like better, red or green? Kyle? Either. Neither. No grapes for Kyle. Well, more for me. Who said that? My, my, my. Our story today is about, is about a vineyard. Do you know what a vineyard is? Do you know what a vineyard is? Kelvin does. He just went to one. What's a vineyard? A place where grapes grow. Just lots of vines. They're, they're vines. They're not bushes or trees. I looked that up to make sure I was right today. But they grow grapes. But in our story today, in our story today, God talks about grapes like the country of Israel. That this is the country and this is the people. I say to a person. So did you. But in many ways, this cluster of grapes is like our church. All of us together in one place and each of us grows stronger because of our relationship to the ones next to us. So when you eat grapes from now on, think about our church and think about God. You want a grape? Another grape for you. None for you still. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for grapes. And the use of the grape to teach us about your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you want to take the grapes with you? Okay. So much for the candy cane, huh? Today's scripture is from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my loved one a lo love song for his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it, cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside it, and dug out a wine vat in it. He expected it to grow good grapes but it grew rotten grapes. 
So now, you who live in Jerusalem, you people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I haven't done for it? When I expected it to grow good grapes, why did it grow rotten grapes? Now let me tell you what I'm doing to my vineyard. I'm removing its hedge so it'll be destroyed. I'm breaking down its walls so it will be trampled. I'll turn it into a ruin. It won't be pruned or hoed, and thorns and thistles will grow up. I will command the, co the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord of heavenly forces is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are the plantings in which God delighted. God expected justice, but there was bloodshed. Righteousness, but there was a cry of distress. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill, for our reading this morning. Thank you, Nicole and Kyle, for the wonderful music. A number of years ago, Michelle and I were at a convention out in Los Angeles, and we had planned to finish up the meeting on a, on a Sunday afternoon and then spend the week uh, driving around California. So we headed up the coast. We saw all the tourist things like Big Sur, etc. And then we finished the week by staying with a dear friend of ours, Ralph, at his home in Stockton. You've never met Ralph, uh, but he's actually, he watches every Sunday morning from California. He's online right now. Uh, so good morning, Ralph. While we were with him, we spent an entire day uh, touring uh, Napa Valley. We traveled from winery to winery. And if you've been there, if you've not been there before, let me affirm for you the beauty of this area. The roads are dotted with these humongously large vineyards. They line both sides of the road, and the wineries we went to were simply uh, exquisite. By the way, neither Michelle or I like wine, so we still had a great time, though. But along the way, we, we drove, and we stopped at these little roadside uh, markets. At one, we bought some cheese. At another, we bought some, some meat. At a third, we bought some bread. And we ended our trip at this large uh, winery, this large vineyard, that had this outdoor patio right in the middle. And it was uh, beautifully shaded by these wonderful large trees and these beautiful pergolas. And there we sat and we, we enjoyed a bottle of wine and we made sandwiches from all the meat and cheeses we had collected on our, on our drive that day. And the backdrop of the setting of the, the vineyard and the trees and the pergola and the, and the vines was absolutely perfect. Vineyards and vines and grapes have been used multiple times throughout the Bible as metaphors. And today's example is just yet another one. I invite you not to bow and to pray with me. Let's begin our, let's begin our prayer time. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Loving God, may the meditations of our hearts, the words of my mouth, may they be pleasing in your sight. For God, you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Throughout the Old and New Testaments both, God and Jesus teach the Hebrew people and disciples through parables. Parables are these short stories. They are fictitious they usually use elements common to that day or time, and they're meant to teach us a lesson, or sometimes just to make us think about our actions. And what might seem odd to us, like stories about sheep and crops and lamps, or the threshing floor in a barn, was not odd to those first Hebrew people. To those early hearers and readers of the word, the stories told by the prophet in this case, or by Jesus later in the, in the New Testament, for those readers and hearers, these analogies made perfect sense to them. For us, we need to learn to put ourselves into their shoes, so to speak, 
for these parables to make sense to us. And many times these elements in these stories, they represent people or places or sometimes both. In Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, where Jesus, where the shepherd leaves the one to find it from the 99, the sheep represent a lost soul. And the same is said for the parable of the widow and the lost coin. These parables show concern for just one person that has wandered away from God. And today's reading contains another parable, this one from a prophet, Isaiah, telling us a story as conveyed to the prophet by God. And in today's story, as I said in our children's message, the vineyard itself represents all of Israel and the grapes, the individual Israelite people. Now, if you were to visit a vineyard or a nursery for that matter, it would not be uncommon for you to walk around and see branches that have been cut away from the main bush or tree or vine. This pruning, as they call it, the cutting away, it allows the dead or the dying branches to be cut away to conserve nutrients for those that are growing. It also allows for the good branches to be pruned or trimmed back to allow for the best possible harvest. And the tending of the bush or the vine is a constant job. There's no end to the pruning necessary. For to let it go, it may get out of hand. And once out of hand, may hinder the yield of the grapes, in this case, for years to come. But to tend it properly requires large amounts of time and energy. And there's almost this loving relationship that begins between the vineyard and the person tending it, the owner most of the time. And this relationship develops organically, if you will, between the two. John Calvin wrote the following about the opening verses of today's parable. Quote, No possession is dearer to a man than a vineyard, and there is none that demands a more constant and persevering toil. In this writing, Calvin connects the work of the the owner, the vineyard owner, or the one that tends to the vines, to call to God. And then he calls it God's greatest possession. The vineyard becomes greatest, his greatest possession. A possession that the owner is willing to give constant and persevering toil to continually work on it, to maintain it. And the connection in this parable of the vineyard to God and God's people, they are the possession. The Hebrew people are the greatest possession, the one that is dearest to God. Now you may ask yourself, if this possession is so dear to the vineyard owner, and that he gives it this great amount of tension in both time and care, the last thing that the owner of the vineyard would want is to see its destruction. And for that reason alone, the laborers tend the fields for great amounts of hours. The return for the vineyard owner is that the vines grow and they produce good grapes and a bountiful harvest. In our story today, this vineyard that Isaiah writes about is located on this beautiful hillside that is more than fertile enough to grow good grapes. And the owner of the vineyard takes great care to remove the rocks to make the soil just right so that they will not choke out the vines as they grow. He plants a hedge around the vineyard. The hedge is there to keep out animals. He would use only the finest smaller vines to, to grow great large vines. He would diligently water the vines, take the best possible care of them that he could. The opening verses of today's story remind me of that old saying about a person that is uh, born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Do you know that story, that, that analogy? What it was meant was the person was born with all the advantages possible that could be given to a single person. And the vineyard in this opening two verses is that vineyard. The one created with that silver spoon, so to speak. For this vineyard has all the things that are possible 
to ensure the growth and success of the grapes, including the most loving possible owner that could exist. In the parable, the vineyard owner is God, the vineyard is Israel, and the grapes are the Hebrew people, all given the best possible conditions to grow and to flourish. But yet, verse 3 says, in spite of all that this owner has done, in spite of all that God has done, the vines begin to grow rotten grapes. Other versions of the Bible use the word riled grapes or uh, other words are used to describe the grapes. Now understand that these wild or rotten grapes are bad. They are bad for the vine. They look withered as the picture shows. They are foul smelling and they are poisonous in nature to the vine and to the grapes around it. One commentary I read this past week compared the wild berry to false religions of that day. A religion that sneaks in, sneaks in, and begins to poison the minds of the ones who are once faithful to God. The wild grapes are more than unedible. They steal all the good nutrients from the grapes that are growing. They begin to choke out the grapes that are around them. They are infectious, if you will, and will eventually kill not only the grapes that surround it, but the entire vine that it grows on. Now, God uses these elements in this story because God knows that the people of that day understand grapes. They understand vines. They understand vineyards. They are probably owners of vineyards themselves. They know what it takes to maintain them and grow good grapes. God knows they'll be able to relate to the damage that these wild and rotten grapes can do. And now that God has laid out this case for good grapes versus bad grapes or wild grapes, God just asked them a simple question. If a landowner, if a landowner went through all the trouble to plant this vineyard in the most fertile area, surrounded it by a hedge to protect it, worked the land diligently, watering it as needed, what should the owner expect and let me ask it another way how many of you currently have or have owned in your lifetime a garden almost everybody here you know what it's like to work a garden when I was a little boy my father had a garden one of our neighbors across the alley from us had a large backyard and they offered it to my dad to till up and to plant a vegetable garden in which he did if I remember correctly, he traded all the vegetables that he could eat for my dad's use of the land to grow his garden. And my dad worked so hard on that garden, hours and hours weeding it and tending it and tilling it and then harvesting the, the vegetables from it. So now put yourself in this vineyard owner's shoes. If you had taken all the precautions that this person had done, if you had cleared the land, tilled the soil and put up a fence, plant the finest seeds, what is it that you would expect? A wonderful harvest. And that's what God expects also from his garden, from the vineyard. This is when God reveals to them that in this parable, in this story, that they are the grapes in God's vineyard. And God has done all that God could possibly do so that they would grow in grace, that they, Israel, would become a fruitful nation. But instead of good grapes, God got bad berries. What more was there to do for my vineyard than what I haven't done already for it? God asked them. God crying out again, what else do I need to do? And we have seen this before through other stories. For God is not willing to accept the blame for their behavior. God is not willing to be blamed for their turning away. God is not willing to be blamed for them becoming the bad grapes, for God has done God's part. Author David Guzik writes this, In the story there was nothing left undone by the owner of the vineyard. He did all that he could do. 
In the same way, God cannot be blamed for all the wild grapes Israel has brought forth, for God did all that God could do. This reading in Isaiah today mimics very closely the trial we talked about last week that opens the same book back in Isaiah chapter 1. Israel has had good times. They have turned from God, and now they are on notice of God's punishment that is to come. God is all loving, but God does demand our obedience. That punishment begins with the removal of the hedges They were placed around the vineyard, and as I read this line, it spoke most meaningfully to me. For many times I have prayed for a person, and I have prayed for this hedge of God's protection to be around them. It is a spiritual analogy of a barrier to keep evil at bay, to keep evil away from my friends or those I am praying for. But by removing this hedge, the vineyard becomes susceptible to outside attack. And the attack is warned about in the next line of our text. For without a hedge in place, the vines can be trampled by wild animals, stolen by other people. As Christians, it is our faith, it is our prayers, it is our time with God in study and devotion that build up and reinforce this hedge around us, the one that protects us from outside attacks of the world that we live in today. God then warns about withdrawing his loving care, at least metaphorically in our story. The lack of pruning, the lack of hoeing the land, the growth now of thorns and thistles, the lack of water that begins to dry out the grapes for good. For us today, for me especially, this becomes the hardest part of our story to understand. For it's hard for us to imagine God willing to turn God's back upon the vineyard, upon God's people. For this goes against the God of love that at least I have been taught to believe. The real question for you today to think about is where do you see yourself in today's story because I believe we're all in this story somewhere if faith was a continuum we are all somewhere on this line between non-believer and committed Christians between hot and cold and by the way I'm not saying that's me that's just me like you it's you not if faith is a continuum we're all on this line somewhere And at different times in our life, we travel upon this line all different places. But the goal is to continue to move towards a life fully lived in Jesus Christ. That is what John Wesley called sanctification. Moving from the saving action of God's love, that time that we say yes to the grace offered in Jesus Christ, to the point that he called Christian perfection, going on to being perfect in Christ. Many believe that perfection is impossible. But I often wonder about absolute Christian perfection. And my personal belief is that it happens. That we all reach a time of absolute Christian perfection. I believe that time occurs when we draw our final breath. I believe that is when we are made perfect in Christ. I tend to believe that God used the vineyard, and the grapes as an early model of Christian community. Many single grapes together in a cluster, growing on a vine, dependent upon each other to share resources, to support one another, all for the well-being of each other. I also believe that the grapes represented a person's personal growth. The maturity of the grape from bud to harvest, paralleling a Christian's growth from new Christian to mature spiritual mentor to others. So today, I challenge each of you to look at your own spiritual journey. But look with the eyes of truth, 
ask a trusted friend if you need to. And ask yourself which direction on this continuum you are currently moving. For we should all be moving from left to right, if you will. From that baby Christian to that mature Christian. We are all called to continue moving towards God through Jesus Christ. We are all called to be more faithful. More importantly, we are all called to be more fruitful. But here is your warning. Sometimes pruning will be required, and pruning can be painful. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the words from Isaiah. We thank you for the story of the vineyard and the vines. Loving God, may this congregation be, be a fruitful vine. May we as Christians grow closer and closer to you. May we be approaching that idea of Christian perfection. Loving God, we pray all of this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. The one who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers in now to receive our morning's offering. Would you please come and wait on us? a number of prayer requests this week. Prayers for Barbara with severe back pain, for Joanne Hunter having surgery, a friend of Colleen and Larry Beals, for all who are challenged or threatened by social discord today, calling on the name of Jesus for peace in and around them. Continue prayers for Toshi as he continues to lose weight and struggle with sleeping and appetite. Prayers for his strength. Prayers for Jeanette, the sister of Mary Van Vliet. For Alyssa, Michelle and I's niece having medical issues during final exam week this week. Jeff Pointer having a medical procedure this coming week. Thank you for prayers for me, for my foot, for continued healing. The tendon is indeed torn. Doctor wants to wait and see if it heals on its own before he does surgery though. So prayers for that. Would you please bow? Most gracious and loving God, we come to you today with many prayers of all kinds. Many have been spoken. Many more remain on our hearts. Loving God, we are confident that you are already at work, that you already know the things we are praying for. Loving God, we ask you to be present with us. We ask you to reach out and touch us. Let us know that you're there. You are the creator, the one who brought forth the world as your own vineyard. You are the one that provides every resource that we need. And all you ask of us is that we bear good fruit. As we give our offerings, remind us again of the fruit you desire from us. The fruit of justice, of righteousness. The fruit of witness to those around us. Forgive us for the times when, our, when we have failed you, when our offerings have fallen short, when the only fruit you ever receive from us is our own self-centeredness. We pray for your help this day. We pray for your nudges. We pray that you help us bear the fruit that brings you joy, brings you glory. We pray this day for our missionary, Helen Roberts Evans. 
We pray for all missions in the missionary fields around us. We pray for our sister church, the Josiah F. Yancey Church, for its pastors, Reverend Solomon and Hezekiah. We lift up our country this day. We lift up our church. We pray for those who are in leadership positions around us. May they learn to lead in ways that bring glory to you. We close our prayer time together by praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray as they gathered. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand out for our closing song. No, don't be seated. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, for uh, leading us in our songs this morning. Alex is uh, vacationing up north, returning home right now, so prayers for her for safe uh, travels. And as you travel today, as you leave this place, go in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and may you be filled by the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.